all the applicants um, did a very impressive piece of work. Which brings us to tonight's speaker, who is Dr. Anne Crone, who is project manager for AOC Archaeology Group. She trained as a dendrochronologist whilst doing a PhD at Sheffield University and specialises in the study of all aspects of ancient wood, both structural and artifactual, and has been instrumental in developing dendrochronology in Scotland. She's a leading expert in the study of Scottish cranogs. In fact, she was telling me earlier that um, she was here some considerable time ago to give a talk about another cranog, and has undertaken excavation research on these sites over many decades and has published widely on the subject. The title of her talk tonight is The Life and Times of Black Lock of Merton, an Iron Age wetland settlement in southwest Scotland. And thanks, thank you. Okay, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is my first face-to-face -face lecture for nearly two years, so I hope that I remember what to do. Um, while the title uh, slide is up there, I thought I'd go through the basics, the where, the when, and the why, and the who. Um, although I'm making this presentation tonight, um, the project has been jointly run with, by my colleague Graham Cavers, whose name is up there. We both work for AOC Archaeology Group. And as regards the logos at the bottom, Historic Environment Scotland has provided most of the funding for the excavation and the post-excavation programme. And our um, work there has been enhanced by our collaboration with the Whithorn Trust, which is based at near nearby Whithorn who each year have raised uh, funding for a community-based project which involved workshops, uh, video production, and the, build, the construction of a roundhouse, which is based on the excavations. And you'll see more of that um, site later. And if you're ever in the neighborhood, I would recommend going to see this reconstruction. It's quite uh, magnificent. It's also resulted in the presence of a core group of increasingly experienced volunteers many of whom you see up on the screen, without whose, um, whom the evidence that I'm about to present um, tonight could not have been uncovered. So the where, um, it, the site is in uh, southwest Scotland in Galloway, and it's on that triangular peninsula of uh, land at the bottom there, known as the Maccas. It's the landscape of um, sort of rolling agricultural land with a little bit of high... Uh, moorland um, and the site you can see it down it's it's situated just inland off the uh, west coast of the of the Maccas. The area is speckled with locks and with cranogs um, several of which we've investigated and which I'll mention briefly later on. And the why? Um, well the site has been known since the 19th century but I'll come back to that shortly. It returned to the light of day in 2010 when the farmer was digging a drainage ditch through boggy land. Um, the digger driver found two oak posts. That's the digger driver standing very proudly next to the fine spot. And luckily for us, he recognized them as ancient and the farmer contacted the museum. We subsequently carried out some test pitting near the, where the posts had been uh, found and uncovered in a small trench in situ stakes and um, horizontal pieces of wood. And the radiocarbon dating indicated that we were looking at Iron Age activity. As to the when, well, the, the site was not scheduled. Um, it had no legal um, protection, but it was clearly under threat because of the debt drainage. So in 2013, Historic Environment Scotland agreed to fund a season of excavation on the structure that we'd uncovered um, in the test pit, um, basically to confirm the nature of the site. But what the excavations also demonstrated was that the site had suffered significant um, dehydration in the past and that this was going to continue. Um, the very drainage that had exposed it will continue to impact on the water table, which has preserved it up until now. 
So subsequently, um, HES agreed to fund a program of seasonal excavations that ran from 2015 to 2019. And they're now funding the post-excavation program through to publication, which hopefully will be in the next couple of years. As I said, the um, site's been known since the 19th century. Uh, the landowner, Sir Herbert uh, Maxwell, seen here in all his splendor, was a very passionate antiquarian, and he investigated many of the sites, the archaeological sites on his land. Very rapidly, it has to be said. This is the only paragraph um, which re uh, reports his work at Blacklock, and as he says, his men only worked for four hours. Nonetheless, he did identify features that we were able to recognize um, nearly a century later, which I've highlighted. And he also commented on the drainage of the lock. He said in 1885 that for 80 years, so from about 1800, the lock had been drained and its bed repeatedly cropped and planted. And a brief survey of the cartographic evidence indicates that the black lock was a small body of open water until at least the late 18th century. It, it appears as such on the um, estate map up in the top corner there. An open body of water is still shown on the mid-19th century Ordnance Survey map, although as we know from Maxwell, it had already been drained, so it's probably just a marshy bog by then. However, as you can see, the site, the red dot, lies to the south of that open body of water already. By the, the 20th century, the lock had definitely disappeared. In the AP at the bottom there, the site lies, it's the red spot again, it lies at the confluence between two major drains. Um, and the old lock bed lies, it's difficult from here, but it's, um, it lies under the woodland that um, lies just to the right of the site. All the area, the open field um, to the foreground, you can see from the shadow that it's all very, very um, damp and floods easily, hence the reason for the, the farmers' uh, need to um, drain, to cut the drains. But what this history demonstrates is that for at least two centuries, the site has been subject, subjected to major fluctuations in the water table with subsequent loss of organics, as you'll see. The, top, the topographic set, uh, setting of the site has been reconstructed using LIDAR data and flood modeling to show the extent and depth of the former lock basin. It would have been about 10 hectares um, in area. The modeling shows that the site was located on the edge of the sort of higher and drier ground on the southern shore of the, um, the lock and that it sat in the shallows around the, the lock um, itself. And using uh, geochemical and paleoecological indicators from cores taken across the um, old lock bed, we've been able to demonstrate that by the time the site was built, it would have been in a shallow, um, fen-like environment rather than a, a standing body of water. Terrestrialization of the lock had begun in the early first millennium BC, and the lock margin had clearly retreated prior to construction. There would still have been pools of open water. There would have been a little bit of moving water as well. But essentially, the site had been built on the edge of what was already becoming marshland. The site lies in, within scrub woodland today. This photograph shows us uh, coming to work in the morning. We're walking across the old lock bed. So you can see the reeds and rushes. But you can also see the size of the trees that now grow on the site. Um, the farmer tells us they're 30 years old, but some of them are certainly substantial enough to have influenced um, the position, the shape, and the size of some of our trenches, as you can see from the, the topographic survey there. I'll be returning to the issues of the issue of definitions and labels later, but before I go any further, it's useful to clarify what type of site Blacklock is. Maxwell had called um, Blacklock a cranog, um, which is, um, as you probably know, one of these artificially, um, con mostly artificially constructed island sites that we find throughout Scotland and also in Ireland. 
And we thought we were going to be excavating a Cranog too, but what our excavations have demonstrated is that there is no artificial foundation for the site at all. Everything has been built directly onto, um, onto the surface of the peat. So we're, we've been referring to it as a lake, or, or more correctly, as it's in Scotland, a lock village or lock settlement. Um, and this distinction between a lock village without an artificial base and a cranog with an artificial base becomes significant, as we'll see later. The settlement covers an oval-shaped area of slightly higher ground, roughly 50 by 60 uh, meters across, which is connected to the um, shore by a small uh, causeway down in the south there. We've never been able to um, fully define the perimeter of the site because of water levels, so we've defined it using that, um, uh, that uh, contour. And it, it is a very, very slight rise in peat that the site, the settlement is built on. Our chronological framework for the site indicates that there are three major phases of episodes of occupation, all in the latter half of the um, first millennium BC. The chronological evidence comes primarily from dendrochronology, the quantities of oak used in the settlement, enabling us to construct probably the most tightly dated sequence of activity on any Iron Age site in the UK at present. What you're looking at here is a bar diagram which shows all of the um, calendri calendrically dated oak from the site. All activity begins in episode one in 437, 435 BC. We've got no evidence for any activity on the site before that date. We do have a couple of reused timbers down at the very bottom, um, but uh, which suggest activity in the vicinity, but probably on the shore in the uh, 6th century BC. Episode 1 consists of a settlement of at least three roundhouses clustered in the northern half of the island around a trackway, you see from the plan there, which through the lifetime of the settlement was the main arterial um, called routeway from the centre out to um, the causeway off the, off the island. Um, I mentioned uh, organic decay earlier, and this is really exemplified in the condition of the trackway as we move through the site. So the um, photograph on the right shows the trackway as it passes between structure one and uh, five up in the northern half of the site. And you can see how poorly preserved that is. Um, the wood can't hold its own weight. It's very, very decayed. But in contrast, the site, the photograph on the other side shows it um, near where the midden is uh, shown on the map. And you can see how well preserved the timbers are. We've got, uh, you know, woodworking evidence, tool marks. The bark survives. They're in, uh, it's in fantastic condition down there. Um, the trackway was built with alder logs laid across the axis of the trackway with alder runners defining it on either side. And at three points along the trackway, there was an oak threshold timber, um, which I'll come to later, um, which you can see in the, the plan just there. The settlement, the episode one settlement, lay within a palisade of closely set alder um, timbers. And you can see that in the, the top uh, photograph um, which is the only area that it was exposed in. Um, I'm sorry for the wiggly red arrows, but I wasn't sure how to do this. So where the palisade meets um, the trackway, um, it terminates in an oak post, which is what you're seeing at the bottom just there. In this um, aerial view of the trackway, you can see that threshold timber that I was talking about, and you can perhaps see that there's a groove along it. It's been, um, a ridge has been cut out of it. And we think that what this is is part of a gate mechanism. Um, at the right-hand side, we, there's uh, the piece of wood that you can see at the top there is what we're calling a gudgeon block. And it had a post in situ, and we think that the, it, this, the gate would have been supported on that. It would have swiveled back against the threshold timber, and it would have been pinned in place by an oak peg, which was still in situ in the post down in the corner there.
Of the three roundhouses in uh, episode one, we've only excavated structure two most extensively. It's a roundhouse, 12.8 uh, meters in diameter, with double outer walls, um, an inner post ring to support the roof, and a massive uh, rectangular stone built hearth at the center. There's also um, another group of posts around, around the hearth which form a five sided um, polygon. And there's a very clear axial line from north to south from the post at the back of the polygon, which is right at the top, at the top of the slide, that comes through the center of the hearth and out through the entrance, um, which lies um, at this side of the, the slide. This is the house that the reconstruction at Whithorn was um, based on. And this is the, the reconstruction that you can see um, at the bottom here. Uh, if you go inside the reconstruction, there's, it's almost cathedral-like. The amount of space is um, astonishing. You wouldn't get that impression just looking at a, a flat plan. So I was going to take you through some of the uh, features of the, of the structure. So the double outer walls, um, various views of them. In the left-hand photograph, you can see the, a, a stout inner wall and an outer wall of, made of slighter posts. And all, in all of these photographs, you can see the wickerwork, um, the, so it's the bottommost uh, courses of the wickerwork walls. Strangely enough, although it's a double wall, so it's got a cavity in between, we never found any evidence for um, any packing in the cavity. And given the level of preservation that you can see, we would surely have found it if there had been any there. As the walls come round to meet the entranceway, which is, lies at the foreground of the photograph over on your left, it changes construction and it's, they've, it's built with planks. So you can perhaps see these big oak planks um, on the, the sort of outer, um, outer skin of the double wall and the inner skin. I've, I've put this photograph of uh, one of my colleagues excavating so that you can see the scale of these planks. Um, they're 50 to cent 70 centimeters uh, wide. They come from massive oak trees, um, some of which were up to 500 years in, in length. These have been a, a core uh, of the, the dendrochronological framework. They would have um, created a sort of facade on either side of, uh, either side of the doorway, which you can see in the reconstruction just there. And the post ring to support the roof. All of the posts, uh, um, except for two exceptions, um, bore these unusual concave bases. We've never encountered them before. Um, but they make sense. Um, they're a way of dealing with the unstable substrate of the peat. Um, they would have sat over the uh, radial roundwood timbers um, of the, the subfloor um, structures. The only one that was a, a pencil-shaped tip, I can't run over and uh, identify it, but it's, it was at the point at which the um, post ring meets the... Um, entrance structure, so it clearly had a, a securing function, whereas um, these concave base posts would have spread the roof, the weight of the roof across, across the floor. And in between each of the posts, there was um, a sill beam, an alder sill beam, which I think you can see clearly in this photograph, the ring of uh, uh, sill beams along the top there. Um, this, would, this created a very distinct um, division between an outer annulus and um, an inner uh, center around the hearth, which you can see in the foreground um, just there. And this is, this is one of the best preserved of the sill beams. You can see that it's been notched at either end to fit around one of the posts in the post ring. And you can see the um, holes for the stakes of the, um, the screen. The, what you're looking at at the back is not the collapsed screen, that's actually part of the uh, wickerwork subfloor, but there's a, a reconstruction down in the foreground here showing you know, what it would have looked like. Obviously, one of the things that we can't reconstruct is whether it was a wickerwork screen that came up to just ankle height, possibly just to retain bedding behind it in the outer annulus, whether it was waist height uh, or even um, higher. 
And as I said, the houses were built directly over the peat, and so a lot of effort was taken to ensure that the floors remained dry. Subfloors of radial timbers were laid down. Um, these are the ones over which those concave posts would have sat, and you can perhaps see them in the photographs here. And over these timbers, uh, brushwood, bundles of brushwood was laid in the photograph on the left. You can see they've been sort of woven sort of roughly in and out of the, um, the radials, but also they laid down discrete uh, wickerwork hurdles. And in the one on the right, you can perhaps see, it's poorly preserved, but you can perhaps see um, the weaving of one of those hurdle screens. And then over the uh, wickerwork screens, um, they laid down, the builders laid down carpets of plant litter. And these are what we're calling the active floor surfaces. This is where the occupation took place, not on those, um, the subfloors. Um, they were built up with masses of compacted uh, layers of bracken, sedges, uh, rushes, um, and, uh, you know, sort of bits of uh, brash. And in the micromorph sections at the bottom there, you can see well, the, the bracken and sedges in a thin section. In the, the upper slide, you're looking at the sequence, the buildup of the floor levels in um, structure two. So at the very bottom, you can see the wickerwork, the primary wickerwork floor lying over the natural peat. Above that, you can see a sort of big wadge of greeny gray, quite shiny material. And this is that compacted floor material. It's it becomes really hard. It presumably started off as, you know, sort of this sort of depth and then was just compacted down with wear. Above that, you can see another wickerwork um, subfloor. And then again, above that, another layer of this compacted floor litter. And then the final floor surface in structure two is an orange clay, which you can see between the two stones there. We've applied a suite of analyses to understand how these floors were used and how they've built up. Uh, micromorphology, macroplant, insects, um, and lipid biomarkers. What these show is that the floors were, were cleaned regularly. So the foul surface of the plant litter um, was removed and then fresh litter was laid down. This multi-proxy approach has produced some surprises. Um, the lipid biomarkers, I think this is the first application in um, a domestic, on, a, in, on an archaeological site in a domestic setting. Um, and what they showed was a variable fecal um, signature throughout the house from human sources in phase one, but changing to mainly ruminant in phase two. However, we don't have any macrofossil evidence um, in the form of coprolites. I think we've got maybe trace amounts in some of the um, thin sections. The insect assemblage displays very low concentrations of house and stable fauna and very few dung flies, which we would expect if we did have um, a lot of animals in the house. This apparent contradiction could be explained by that regular replacement of the dirty floor layer, something that, as I said, is also indicated in the micromorph evidence. This would prevent the buildup of particularly foul conditions in the house thus removing the macrofossil evidence, but leaving the fecal evidence at molecular level, molecular level um, in the deposits. <clears throat> As I said, there were big, there were massive stone hearths um, at the center of each house. Um, the hearth, hearths consisted of mounds of cobbles um, contained within big um, stone curbs, and the hearth surfaces were formed by either um, big slabs of stone or clay surfaces. Um, and this is the section through um, the hearth stack in structure one. The weight of these must have caused them to sink, and I think you can see in the section up there how much they've sunk into the um, peat surface. And this may have been the reason why the hearths in each house were built uh, twice, rebuilt twice, one on top of the other. So you've got three hearths up in that section there. But the the interesting thing is that um, even when they were first built, they, these must have stood up until to about calf level. These were high, you know, very high um, structures in the center of the floor, not the sort of flat stone hearths that we're used to um, seeing. 
And these are, these are photographs of the um, paths in structure two, the earliest within a timber framework and a clay surface, and a later one with the stone um, surface and a big stone heart around the outside. So both the um, hearths and the floor surfaces were replaced twice after rebuilding. And so was the entrance um, structure into the, uh, into the house. Um, I should point out that we have absolutely no evidence that the superstructure, so the, the walls or the posts in the postering, none of those were replaced, which obviously goes to um, the duration of the structure, which we'll come back to later. The primary um, entrance structure that you can see up there, the house itself um, sits at the um, top of the photograph. And this is probably the most um, complex piece of uh, joinery that we found on the site. Um, you can perhaps see the oak walls coming around to meet um, the entrance on either side. Um, it consists of these, big, these two uh, longitudinals, which had three big mortises cut into them. And in the mortises were squared oak um, posts. So that you can imagine entering the building, you're walking between the facade of big oak planks on the outside, in through what was basically an oak-lined um, hallway, and then being confronted those, with those um, massive stone hearths at the center. So everything about this building feels monumental in its construction, and we think it was designed to impress a visitor into the house. The dating evidence shows that the primary settlement was developed over a period of two to three years. The span of um, dates almost certainly reflects some stockpiling in preparation for construction, um, but there is also a sequence in the dates which suggests that they may have started building the trackway into the settlement first in 430, let's say 7 BC. I can't imagine them building in the winter. So in the spring of 437 BC, at the top, they start building the trackway and they move inwards. In 435 BC, they build structure two using uh, uh, timber as well that's been felled in fourth, the, the previous year. And a year later, they build structure one, which lies at the back of the, the settlement in uh, 435, in 434 BC. Um, we have a string of radiocarbon dates from the stratified sequence within the house. And Bayesian analysis suggests that it was in use for no more than 30 to 40 years, and possibly even less. So we reckon that the episode one occupation probably ended around 400 BC. So a very tightly uh, dated sequence. Sadly, we found very few artifacts um, in any of the structures. And I say sadly because it would have been very nice to have some diagnostic Iron, Iron Age artifacts against which we could apply these um, tight um, dendro dates. But presumably, uh, we found so little because they kept the houses so clean. But we always thought that somewhere we would find um, some sort of rubbish dump or a midden. And eventually we did. Um, it was to one side of the trackway and outside the um, palisade. So exactly where you might imagine, you know, dumping your rubbish. Um, it, it's not very midden-like. It produced some animal bone and shell, some crucible fragments, and a large saddle quern. But the most exciting object, um, probably from the whole excavation, is this uh, wooden bowl. It was found crushed, so that's how it um, uh, looked when we lifted it. So you can see in the bottom, you can see the um, base, and at the very top, you can probably see the back of the, the rim. So it's been reconstructed using uh, photogrammetry, and you can see the, the profile just there. There are currently no parallels for the Black Lock Bowl in the British Isles or even further afield in terms of its um, morphology, its decoration, and the species used. It's been made using um, meloidii, which is a, it could be a fruitwood apple pear, possibly a rowan. And you can see the, the decoration, which has been pulled out in a strip at the bottom. It's very geometric. Um, it's been made with incised lines and uh, stab marks. Um, it's, it's very unusual. We do have other decorated 
wooden bowls from the Iron Age from Glastonbury, but they're more recent, um, first, second century BC, and it's the curvilinear Latin decoration, nothing like this. So the only parallel that I could find is from Danebury. Um, so you could perhaps see some parallels in the profile of the Blacklock Bowl and this ceramic bowl from uh, Danebury. And the, certainly the um, motifs, the decorative motifs are quite similar. But again, Danebury's um, a lot more recent than um, the Blacklock Bowl. So um, it's... The bowl remains, it's currently the earliest known example of a lathe turned bowl in the British Isles. But the skill and expertise that it um, displays, it's very fine walled and very finely finished, indicates that even by this early date, um, lathe turning must have been a very widely practiced, commonplace technique. A bowl like this didn't um, come out of nowhere. The next episode, again, consists of at least three structures all built in the southern half of the island. Um, this episode has been much more di uh, difficult to date because we have very little oak used in the construction of the buildings, which is interesting in itself. Stratigraphically, we know that both structures three and four were built over the old episode one palisade, so it must post-date 435 BC. So if we allow for some time for its use, say a couple of decades, we think that episode two must have begun sometime after 400 BC. Bayesian analysis of the radiocarbon dates and the other chronological evidence is not yet complete, um, but it does look like uh, episode two occurred in the early fourth century BC, so, so say from about 400 to 370 BC. And what we're beginning to think is that it's possible that it's not, um, that episode two is actually an expansion of the episode one settlement into the rest of the island and not a replacement, and that it's possible that some of the episode one houses in the northern half of the site were still in use, at least at the very beginning of the um, episode. The episode two houses are very different to the earlier houses. Again, we've only excavated one um, extensively. This is structure three. Um, you can see the trackway running down on the left-hand side, and that mass of timber is structure three there. It's much more shoddily made. Um, the walls consist of a single lines of relatively small stakes, um, which I hope you can see sort of curving around and around the bottom just here. Um, we had, there is, there was a post ring. Um, we have two surviving posts, again, concave-based um, posts. Um, but the entrance is defined simply by two horizontal logs, um, which open directly onto the uh, trackway. So you can perhaps see them in the, the trench at the very top, in the little piece of it that sticks out. You can see the entrance there. So it's opening directly out onto the trackway. There's nothing of the monumentality of structure two here. It's also smaller. It's about 9.6 meters in diameter as opposed to the 12.8 meters of um, structure two. But some things were the same. Um, in the middle of the house, there was also a stack of hearths, but instead of three, we have seven in the stack. Uh, in the photograph on the left-hand side, you're looking at that stack of um, hearths in section. Um, they're much smaller and much more varied in their construction. I've put a few examples up there. Um, the, you know, they're mainly sort of flat circles of um, flat stones, but we also have ones made of clay at the bottom. Um, the differences in construction suggest that they could have served different functions, um, but food preparation was definitely one of them. Um, hazelnuts, shellfish, an animal bone have been found in deposits in and around the hearths. And in one of the other episode two houses, structure six, we found these very distinctive ovens in which hazelnuts and shellfish have also been um, cooked. So in the photograph on the right here, you can see the primary hearth sitting over its um, subfloor of uh, wickerwork screens. Um, the, the, the active floors have been removed in this photograph, 
and you can see the second oven um, above it. And better in the left-hand side, you can see that it was constructed with a, um, a surface of flat stones. You can see the clay dome and the layers of uh, fuel debris and food debris um, in it. Back to structure three. Um, as in the uh, episode one houses, the floors were also refurbished every time a new hearth was built. And I showed the, these are um, some examples of the different um, types of subfloor that were used. In the top image, it's the primary um, subfloor. You can see the radial timbers, and hopefully you can see that there are at least three separate hurdle screens. Um, one like this, one like that, and one like that, um, uh, lying over the radi radial timbers. In phase six, they've just put down bundles of uh, brushwood laid tangentially around the house with the radials sitting directly over them. And in phase seven, they're laying brushwood down in a sort of vaguely herringbone um, style. These um, differences in the subfloor appear to relate to radial divisions within the house. What is clear in, st in structure three is we don't have the annular divisions that we saw in the, um, in the episode one houses. Instead, they're radial divisions um, with different types of subfloor structure in different parts of the house. So in the plan, you can see at the bottom, you can see that in the uh, southwest quadrant, and this is the photograph shown here, you can see that there's the sort of radials and brushwood. And just to the left of it, you can see that there's um, an orange, an orangey, sandy clay surface. And that radial division there remained in use throughout the, um, uh, the use of the, the occupation of the house. And the plant litter floors, um, there was almost like a fault line in them at that division. You could sort of get your hand down. So I think there had been um, a screen there, but it had been removed. We also realized that there was probably a radial division um, under the balk, which comes up from the, the southern edge of the, um, the trench. Um, but of course, it was under the balk, and it's only later that we realize the differences on either side. But the major difference, um, which is, is obvious just here, is between the north and the southern halves of the house. There were absolutely no wood, wooden subfloors in the northern part of the house. At one point when we were digging, because we were digging the two trenches, um, together, we thought we might be looking at two different houses, one lying on the other, because the differences were so pronounced. In the section at the top there, you're looking at the um, floors in the northern part of the house, and it's just a 50 centimeter de depth of this plant litter material with no subfloors um, at all. Um, so clearly, different functionings take functions taking part in different parts of the house. Um, and this, these differences, as I say, were also reflected in the floor coverings. In the northern half of the house, it was almost exclusively bracken. And apart from some trample around the hearth, the floors in this half had been kept very, very clean. In contrast, the floors in the southern half were much dirtier. Food debris, uh, butchery waste was present. There were pockets of um, fly pupae. And there were differences in different quadrants. In the south, southwest quadrant, the floors had been replaced much more frequently, which has produced um, these sharp discontinuity boundaries that you can see in this um, slide just here. So you can see the decomposed material at the very bottom and the, more the fresher bracken that's been laid down on the top of it. Um, we did also find traces of coprolites and fecal matter Whereas in the southeast quadrant, um, so obviously maybe another little room, there was no evidence of uh, fecal remains. But the contrast between the two halves of the house is even more pronounced when we look at the distribution of the artifacts. These were all found in the southern half of the house. We found slag um, and other evidence of metalworking, such as the, the little crucible in the middle of the upper line. Um, and this range of small artifacts. Um, we've got a small bone comb, which was, may have been used in textile manufacture, um, a little circlet of uh, hazel twigs. That's a cluster of puff balls um, down in the bottom there. We found 26 within one deposit 
they had all been, um, they had been dried, which means that they weren't being collected for food. They were probably being collected for something like tinder. Um, this object in the middle, which is an ash vessel of some sort. But most interestingly uh, for me was this um, uh, object down in the corner here, which is a lathe turning waster. Initially, we had wondered whether that the bowl that you saw earlier was imported, but this um, indicates that they were indeed lathe turning on site. And this was also the same species as the bowl itself. All of these objects are small enough to have been lost when they were laying down um, the floors of um, plant litter. If you can imagine bringing in big bundles of bracken, what have you, these would, um, could quite easily have been um, lost. But there are two objects um, which must have been deliberately placed under the newly refurbished floor surfaces. Um, the upper one um, is a... We're calling it a baton because we don't really know what it is. Um, it's a beautifully made U baton, um, a spindle turned U um, that's been finished, um, you know, highly polished uh, with these sort of decorative collars on it. I don't know if you can see, but there's a hole at either end of it. So it, it is part of a composite object. It would have taken something like a dowel. The best suggestion that we've got at the moment is that it could be part of a, a small frame uh, for something like tapestry or embroidery. You know, the aesthetic quality, quality of the object suggests that it was the prized possession of someone. And we think it's been deliberately laid before um, a new floor was laid down. Similarly, at the bottom here, um, this is an unused triangular crucible. As you can see, it's been laid in place at the end of one of the radial um, structures. We do have examples, Colts Lock, one of the other crannogs that we've excavated. We found wooden artifacts, including a, um, an ard chair, a square bowl, and um, some you know, stave-like objects. And these had been deliberately laid down under the floors, possibly as a, a, you know, a, a, good, a foundation deposit for good luck. And we wonder whether with these objects, this is signal, signaling changes in the use of the house um, uh, with each rebuild of the hearth and floor laying. The differences between the episode one and two houses are quite pronounced in construction, cleanliness, and the use of space in the house. We've speculated that the episode two houses might be craft workshops as opposed to domestic uh, residences, mainly because we have more evidence of the types of activity taking place in them. But it might simply be that the, they were inhabited by a community with differing attitudes to domestic space. For it. What is, whatever their status, um, the evidence suggests that they were all from um, agricultural communities. Um, the iron share shown up there was found uh, from structure one, so from episode one and it indicates that they were cultivating, and we found evidence that they were processing and consuming a range of cereals listed up there, and that they were uh, consuming cattle, sheep, and pig. They were exploiting the natural environment, going down to the shore to collect shell and fish, and collecting a range of nuts and berries. And finally, to episode three, the final episode of activity on the island. Um, the evidence for this episode consists mainly of the elaboration of the defensive perimeter around the island. As you'll see, we have very little evidence as to what's going on in the interior. The dendro evidence places all this building activity in the 3rd century BC. It began at least a century after the end of episode 2, if you remember in um, uh, three, about 370 BC. It begins in 278. Um, BC. And from then on, for about 50 plus years or so, there's constant refurbishments uh, to the defences around the island. That's the list of felling dates um, at the top there. This summarises all of that activity. Uh, in 278, um, which is, oh yes, over in the uh, right, the, over on the left hand side, um, the defensive perimeter was built, consisted of a low earthen bank and this uh, palisade of 
um, order posts, a bit like the earlier um, palisade. At least 16 years later, this was replaced by an earthen rampart reta retained by an external palisade of oak posts set into an, a stone-filled slot. Um, and in the top photograph, you're looking at the rampart there. It's a very distinctive orange sand with um, a cobble surface. And you, as you get, the people in the top are wor working in the entrance area, and you can perhaps see the um, stone revetted terminus of the rampart just there. In 243 BC, um, major changes to the defensive perimeter were made. A palisade of massive oak planks which you can just about see in the dappled sunlight in the bottom photograph here, um, was constructed. These were um, planks like those that you saw in the episode one house, set edge to edge um, and along the same alignment as the earlier palisade. And finally, in 223 BC, we've got a single large post near the shoreline, which indicates activity there. As I said, we really haven't a clue as to what's happening in the interior. Um, every, in every trench that we exposed, we came across these big screeds of um, stones. They have no plan, uh, there's no pattern to them, and we have no chronological evidence at all from them. They clearly relate to the episode uh, three um, activity, but we don't know what. So that's, that's the excavated evidence. Um, and we're just going to spend um, the last wee while um, trying to put Blacklock into context. Um, I mentioned definitions earlier and the question of what type um, of site Blacklock is. Wetland settlement in Scotland has always been, has been defined almost exclusively as the Cranog. Um, as I said, it's a, commonly defined as an island, usually artificially constructed with structures on top. And these are uh, examples of, of classic Cranogs with the Milton Lock reconstruction down at the bottom there. As you've seen, the settlement at Black Lock is built on an island of sorts, but it's entirely natural, and the structures have all been built directly onto the surface of the natural peat. So it's not a Cranog in the classic sense of the word. We initially thought that it might be viewed as a, a proto-Cranog, uh, a settlement built on a natural island, a concept out of which the classic um, Cranog evolved. Um, but the dendro evidence has undermined that theory, indicating that Black Lock is contemporary with the more classic Cranog in Cult's Lock. Um, we excavated this, year, this um, a few years ago. Uh, it's, it lies about 30 kilometers away um, towards um, Stran Ra. This is what the Cranog looks like today in the um, uh, top left-hand corner. It's a little promontory. But when it was occupied, it would have been a discrete island with um, a causeway and with a big roundhouse, possibly two, on it. Oak timbers used in the construction were felled between 438 and 412 BC. We don't have exact felling dates. But it spans the felling date of 435 BC for episode one at Black Lock. That's the bar diagram. Uh, in the bottom there. What this means is that Cult's Lock and Black Lock were constructed um, at the most within a few decades of each other and possibly only a year or so apart. And so we've begin, begun to think of these wetland sites as one of many different responses to the desire or the need to live out in the water during the first millennium BC. For the communities building them, it was the ability to live out in the lock that was important not the nature of the foundation and structure, which we as archaeologists have got very hung up about. And Blacklock is almost certainly not unique. It's currently the only known site in Scotland of its type, but I think it, they just haven't been recognized until now. A brief review of the antiquarian literature reveals the example of Dowelton Lock, which is only a few miles from Blacklock. It contains a classic Cranog, uh, Miller's Cairn, but it also has this scatter of um, stony mounds on the eastern shore. And the antiquarian, Lord Levain, who excavated it, um, reported the discovery, and he described them, I've put his um, comments there, he saw them as single dwellings, and seeing the description, 
they sound very much like the buildings at, um, at Black Lock. Uh, there are, um, so we've been variously describing Black Lock as a wetland settlement, a lock village, a lock settlement. And there are other comparable sites. Um, there's Glastonbury in Somerset. Again, um, it's more recent. Um, and it's, it's obviously much more uh, massive. I'm not sure how many houses are there, but it's significantly larger than Black Lock. These two sites from Ireland, Cully Hannah and Clonfinlock, are very, very uh, comparable roundhouses within a, a palisade. But as you can see from the dates, which are also dendro dates, it's much, they're much earlier. They're sort of Bronze Age um, in date. But looking for wetland parallels further afield and getting bogged down in terminology, is obscuring the more important issue, which is not whether it's a Cranog or a Lock village, but what it contributes to our understanding of Iron Age settlement patterns in Southwest Scotland. For what our um, excavations have demonstrated is that the Black Lock of Merton is in fact an Iron Age palisaded enclosure, a type of uh, site found across uh, Scotland. These are examples from Central and Southwest Scotland. But, but which we have found for the first time in a wetland environment. And it is in this happy coincidence of circumstance that the significance of the site lies. If we were to remove all but the earth fast features at Black Lock, we would be left with plans um, that look very different um, to the, those of these crop mark sites. But at Black Lock, we have the advantages of the surviving organics, the timber and plant components of the structures, the analysis of which is providing us with a rich and much more textured picture of the life cycle of these settlements. We are learning about their duration, the conditions within the houses, the use of space within them, the importance of monumentality in their structure, and also about the nature of abandonment, um, data which is all feeding into our understanding of other palisaded enclosures. And finally, the million dollar question, why would anyone want to live out on a wetland site? Um, I've put that photograph up there to show you the kind of conditions that we excavated in. This is what would be, we would be confronted with every morning. Um, we'd have the pumps running for at least an hour and during the course of the day, they would rise up again. And the, the occupants almost certainly lived with conditions like that. In fact, we have evidence from the insects that they dealt with flooding episodes um, fairly frequently. The, you know, we've looked at all the practical excavation uh, explanations as to why they might live, uh, build, you know, build these settlements. But both Black Lock and Cults Lock are very small locks. You could walk around them in less than an hour. Um, so, you know, if you were arguing that they were there to exploit the fish and the wildfowl, you know, you could have lived on the edges and been able to do that easily enough. As I said, the fact that uh, Black Lock and Cults Lock were built at the, at the same time indicates that what it appears to be was that it was all about living out on the water. And elsewhere in the Iron Age, there's an, a wealth of evidence that wetlands were venerated. You've got metalwork, swords, mirrors, etc., were deposited in water. And I've just shown you this example here because we have a similar um, uh, phenomenon at, we see that at Carl, uh, Carling Walk Lock down in southwest Scotland where a large uh, deposit of uh, metalwork was put into this cauldron and put into the lock there. So it may be that living out in the water was part of the same phenomenon, that it was important for some part of the community to live out there, to act as a go-betweens between the real world and the other world that the, the water signified. This is all very speculative, but as I've explained, it's difficult to find any practical explanation to a, a 21st century mind for living out in the water. And I think I'll leave it there and say thank you very much for listening.